So, away to the omnis, and welcome to a video on noun case, particularly nominative, accusative, and dative. Uh, please be aware that I'm going to go quite fast because this is a video you can pause and rewatch. Um, so, these are the endings that we're going to be talking about in this video, just so that we know what's going on. Um, this is particularly useful if you're in year seven and eight. If you are beyond this, obviously, you will know that there are more endings than this. So, how does noun case work in English? Well, nouns are naming words, i.e. they name person, places, things, objects, etc. Um, the case is the role that that noun plays in a sentence. Um, so, two examples here. Nominative being the subject, i.e. it does something, and accusative being the object, i.e. something happens to it. Um, in English, we tend to work this out by the order of the sentence. So, we can see two sentences here. Um, the slave carries the sword, and the sword carries the slave. By reversing the order, we have changed the meaning of the sentence. Um, in either case, the, the first bit of the sentence is the nominative, it's doing something, and then it does something to the accusative, to the object. This is how English does it, very nice and easy. Uh, Latin, instead of doing it by order, does it by ending. So you change the ending of the word, and that will tell us whether or not it's going to be nominative or accusative or anything else. The order isn't actually important in Latin most of the time. It doesn't change the meaning of the sentence, as you can see with my examples on the right. Um, all of these sentences mean the exact same thing. They all mean the slave carries the sword, because we can see that the word servus is nominative in each of those sentences doesn't matter where it is in the sentence, it's still nominative. Um, saying that, there is more or less a correct order. Um, it doesn't make a difference in terms of meaning at this level, but if you're going to learn it, please try to learn that the general order in Latin is nominative, followed by accusative, followed by verb. Verb tends to go at the end. So, let's have a look at some examples. So we can see that the nominative is the subject of the sentence in Latin. So we can see some examples, which I'm going to go through and translate. So we can see the first sentence here, the sir was laborat, so is nominative, he is doing something. The puellae navigant, the girls are doing something, they're sailing. Reges spectant, the kings are watching or looking at. Um, you might also have sentences with more than one subject. So in the fourth one down here, um, the puellae and the pueri are both listening or hearing. Um, in the fifth one, the rex and his amici are eating. So, you know, we can have more than one subject, but they're all doing the verb. Simple. The accusative, therefore, is the object. Notice, with particularly these first few sentences, um, I have always given the accusative first. There is no nominative in this sentence as such. You need to look at the verb. So with the first sentence, what cat ends with a T, so he's doing it. He or she or it calls the slave. Second sentence. They praise the girls because it's an unt ending. The girls aren't doing anything, they're accusative. Something has, has to be happening to them. And then the last sentence there, I kill kings, that O ending means I'm doing it. Um, we might also notice that most sentences, particularly at early levels of Latin, are nominative doing verb to accusative. So, four sentence down here, the puellae, they are neckanting a dominum. How do we know it's that way? Well, we know that nominative is doing something, accusative is having it done to it. So it must be the girls kill the master. Fifth sentence, um, the dominus is puniting the servos and the ankylas. Notice that it's not that the master and the slaves are doing something. No, no, no. The accusatives are the one having the thing done to it. So it must be that the master is punishing the slaves and slave girls. Last sentence, uh, the woman is watching or looking at the merchants. Nice and simple. Finally, we get to the dative, which may be a new case toward, for you. Uh, the dative is sometimes called the indirect object of the sentence, which isn't the most helpful definition in the world. Uh, more usefully, you can think of it being two or four in front of a noun. Um, it is, comes from the Latin word to give, so it's related to the concept of giving or doing something for someone. Very charitable case. Um, you can see in our first example over here, there's no nominative, so we only know that it's going to be he, she, or it, just because it's in the verb with that ending t. Um, they're doing something to the pecuniam, the money, and then it, we must have in front of that so it's going to have two or four. So the sensation as a whole is he gives money to the slave, so being dative here. 
Um, in the second example, we can see that the pueli, they must be nominative plural. They are inwenyunting something. So they're, they're finding kibum, which is our accusative, um, and they're doing it for the cannabis. Um, so the girls find food for the dogs. Uh, picture unrelated, he lied. But of course, you may well have moved beyond simple Latin. We may have to consider some slightly more complicated bits. Um, so with the nominative, there's a couple of things that we might want to talk about. The first one being the verb to be. Um, so we think about the sentence, the master is a friend. Which of these two nouns is the subject, is the nominative in the sentence? Well, actually, it's both. They're both being something. That is, the, uh, they're both doing the verb, uh, that the verb being to be here. Um, so if we, if we try and look at these sentences, we can see that both dominus and amicus are both nominative because they're both being something. The master is a friend. And the second sentence, the poeli, they are ankylai. The girls are slave girls. Um, now, the next bit is just for GCSE students. I'm going to say that again. This only happens once you get to GCSE students and you start talking about the passive voice or passive verbs. If you are not in GCSE yet, please do not translate sentences like this. It's almost certainly going to be wrong. Saying that, um, once you have got to that point, uh, the definition, the nominative is the subject, uh, still works. But you can no longer really talk about it doing something because passive verbs get slightly awkward. Um, it is no longer known, it is no longer the agent, the doer in the sentence, although it is still the subject or the focus. Um, so we look at our sentences. Uh, that ter ending means that something's happening to the poeli, even though she's nominative, so it's the girl is loved. Um, and the same with the second sentence, the slaves are punished. Again, if you're not a GCSE, please don't translate sentences like this, you will be wrong. Accusative, a couple of complications with the accusative. Um, one of them is that sometimes it can be difficult to work out whether a verb, whether a noun is nominative or accusative. So particularly with the example of the third declension, uh, that nominative plural and accusative plural endings are the same. So whilst that sentence, Leones gladiatores necant, could mean the lions kill the gladiators or the gladiators kill the lions, because we know that order isn't the deciding factor. But normally, normally the nominative comes first in the sentence. So we can take a wild guess that it's got to be Leonez being nominative and therefore it's the lions kill the gladiators. That is not an absolute rule, um, but in general, nominative comes first. You can try, if it could be nominative and it's first word in the sentence, experiment with it being nominative. Um, there's also a couple of slightly more unusual cases of the uses of the accusative. Uh, one of them is if you're expressing time. Um, so you can see sentence down here, these slaves, they are bibunting quinque horas. Well, we know that sir, we are slaves and bibunters drink. They're not literally drinking quinque horas, five hours. That doesn't make sense. Instead, it's expressing how long they're doing it for. So they're drinking for five hours. Um, this isn't the most helpful uh, way of expressing time in the world, but it's just how it was done. The other major, major, major use of the accusative is having a preposition in front of it, something that explains where you're going or where you are or something about it. Um, so, for example, I sail towards or to the island. Um, you're not technically doing something actually to the island, you're just going towards it. Um, if there's a preposition in front of it, always use the preposition to translate. Don't worry about it being the object. Finally, we get to the dative, which also has a couple of complications. Uh, the first one is actually a problem of English. That is to say, there are some words in English, some verbs rather, in English that sound like their object will be dative. So if I look for something, you know, we're, we're thinking that the next word has to surely be dative. Um, but it's not in Latin, because that's just an English thing. So you can see the first sentence here, the slave girl is expatting the dominum. It's fairly obvious what the order of the sentence is, but if you translate expectat as is waiting for, which is perfectly reasonable, it sounds like the next word's dative. It's just an English thing. Just work out what's going on in the Latin and go from there. Slightly more complicated example here. The servus is quieting pecuniam for the pueli. We can see that pueli must be dative singular here. Um, so it's looking for money for the girl. That first for is just a quirk of English. 
whereas the second for is actually the case of the noun being in the dative. This sounds more complicated than it is. More or less, you should just be able to translate here quite naturally. Um, on the other hand, we also have instances where Latin does need a dative and English doesn't. So, for the example, the word credo, I trust. You know, in, in English, you say, I trust him. We're expecting him there to be accusative. That makes perfect sense. Whereas in Latin, it's almost like the word is going to be dative, as in, like, I give trust to him. It's not quite that, but it's kind of similar to that idea. So we can see our sentence here, the puellae credunt servo, the girls trust the slave. Servo there is dative, but you don't need to say something like the girls trust to the slave. It doesn't sound like in English, just translate it as if it were accusative. Another example, faweo, I favour. Perhaps the original meaning of the word was something like I give my favour to someone. Um, regardless, nowadays you're just going to translate it as the king favours the merchants. Uh, and finally, the dative case is also a really, really common way of expressing ownership of something. Rather than in English where we would normally say the, the boy has a dog, um, in Latin the, the sentence is more like the, the dog is for the boy. Bit of a weird way of saying it, but we can see in our example sentences the service is for the girl. The girl has a slave. Or some vocab here that we probably don't know if we're in, in year seven, eight, and nine Latin. Um, the nomen is for me Marcus, i.e. my name is Marcus. This is far and away the most common way of expressing what your name is in something. In, it, name is in Latin, it's just mihi nomen est and whatever your name is. So noun case. Um, when you are thinking about nouns, i.e. naming words, you have to really, really, really think about the case, the role that that noun plays in the sentence. Is it doing something? Is it the subject? Is it nominative? Is it the object? Is it having some having something done to it, i.e. the accusative? Or do we need to put the words two or four in front of it because it's dative? Hope that helps. Thank you very much.